Let's pray. Lord, we come to you on this Good Friday remembering what you did and what it was like for you on that day. I pray, Lord, as we, as we look at your word, that your Holy Spirit would allow us to have a better understanding of what it cost to pay for our sins. I pray, Father, that it would make us want to love you more and to serve you more faithfully because you paid such a heavy price in giving us your Son. And Lord Jesus, we thank you. But we ask today that you would help us to remember what you did. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Today we've gathered together to remember the darkest day in human history. This was the day that when those who called themselves the children of God conspired with Satan to humiliate, to torture, and to put to death the Son of God. Often people ask why this is called Good Friday when something so terrible happened on that day. We come into the church, the altar is stripped, the cross is usually draped in black, symbolizing the hopelessness felt by the disciples of Jesus. There is no Eucharist today because it's not meant to be a celebration, but a remembrance of that day long ago when our Savior suffered and died on our behalf. The cross was not a symbol of victory, but of defeat in the most humiliating way. The prophets foretold all that the Messiah would go through on behalf of sinners. And one of the most often quoted is Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 6. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our psalm for Good Friday is Psalm 22. It's seen as a messianic psalm. It was a first written as a lament from King David, who was lamenting and expressing powerful sorrow for the persecution of his enemies. Who they were, actually, they were attacking him without cause. And it begins with a cry of abandonment and the petition to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The same cry was taken up by Jesus, who though sin, was sinless, he endured total abandonment, of which David had only experienced a shadow. Verses 6 and 8 are a perfect prophetic picture of what Jesus endured from his enemies as he hung upon the cross. He says, but I am a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. As the events of Jesus' crucifixion on Gol Golgotha unfolds in the Gospels' accounts of the Passion, we can look back to the Old Testament prophets and the Messianic Psalms like Psalm 22 and Psalm 100. And we can remember what happened that day and that it was intentional. It all transpired because God knew what it would take for our sin to be atoned for and for us to be free from the curse of sin and death. Jesus knew the prophecies because as God, he had placed those prophecies in the mouths of the prophets who spoke them. I must confess that I used to feel like when I, when I came to a Good Friday service pretending to be somber and about Jesus being crucified, that I was being fake because I knew that it happened over 2,000 years ago. But more importantly, I knew what happened on Easter morn, the third day when he rose again. It was suggested to me that I should 
focus on my sin, which is why Jesus had to go to the cross on the first, in the first place. And Good Friday was the proper time to contemplate my sin and my part in his crucifixion. And I saw the point, but I really felt like my need to look at my sin, consider my sin, and unrighteousness was something I should do every day. If I love the Lord, I should reflect on and confess my sins daily. Isn't that part of the daily office that we celebrate as Anglicans? We confess our sins daily. As I considered this and prayed for God to open my eyes how I should respond to this day, he reminded me of when I was a child. And for a period of months, several months, I would wake up from terrible nightmares in the middle of the night and I would be terrified. It was totally dark and I would be afraid to make any noise or cry out unless that dreadful thing that was in my room might get me. I longed for morning so that light would shine in the window and I would know that everything was all right again and I was safe. That was a long time ago. So I had forgotten about that darkness and how I felt so alone and without hope. As I considered this, this memory, I realized it was pointing me to two, to two things. It made me experience, number one, that I would never have to know the kind of pain and abandonment that Jesus did. He was made to experience a darkness that I will never have to, to know because he took it upon himself. And as we read Isaiah 53 and then the Gospel of John 18, 1 through 19, 42, everyone turned away from him. Even his disciples ran away out of fear for their lives. And those who had earlier welcomed him as he came into Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They now join with the religious leaders as they stand before Pontius Pilate and they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. It's only been a few days in that transition. And instead of bowing down to the Holy One, the God of Israel, they conspired to have Jesus beaten unmercifully, scourged, spit upon, mocked and crucified. And there was not anyone else that was willing to come to his aid, not even his father who was in heaven. Consider Isaiah 53, 10. Yet I was the, it was the will of the Lord to crush him, and he has put him to grief. And Psalm 22, 1 to 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day. But you don't answer him by night and I find no rest. It was those very words that Jesus cried out on the cross at the moment when his father turned away from him. In Matthew 27, 46, we read, at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry reflected the depth of Jesus' distress as he endured the pain of separation from his father for the first time. And later, the disciples would realize that Jesus was enduring the curse of God's judgment on sin, the full, furious, and dreadful wrath of the Almighty God. And this was all the more agonizing to Jesus because he had enjoyed eternal joyful, unending, and perfectly unified relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so the darkness that he's experiencing is total. It's complete. And there was no hope that relief was going to come from anywhere. He was made to experience the full wrath of God and the terror and hopelessness of hell where God is not. And he did all that, so you and I would not have to. And I realize that you and I have no way of understanding a darkness that is so complete and so totally without hope. Jesus knowingly took this punishment upon himself 
because of his love and the Father's love for us. And that's why the somberness of Good Friday is called that. That's why it's called good. By good, it's not an expression of, of our approval, but that the day is holy. We often fail to consider the consequences of our sins or have a true understanding of how deep they can be embedded into our hearts. A great example of this darkness and the depth of human depravity is seen in, in a portion of our gospel reading tonight. It's in John 19, 31. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high and holy day, the Jews asked Pilate that their, Jesus and the two robbers, their bodies, their legs might be broken, and they might be taken away. The day of Jesus' crucifixion was a day for all the preparations for, for the Sabbath, and it had to be done. This was no ordinary Sabbath. This was the Passover Sabbath. And according to Jewish law, if there were bodies left on crosses during this time, it would defile the land. Now you'll notice that the Jews were willing to join forces with the pagans, with Rome, in order to commit murder. And yet felt compelled to turn right around and insist that the Jewish ceremonial law be obeyed. So they requested that the legs be broken so death would come much quicker. Without the legs to hold up the body, a person would literally suffocate because he could not take in enough air. They had gotten their way. Jesus was dead. Problem solved. And when they came to Jesus to break his legs, the guards realized that he was already dead. And so they pierced his side with a spear to make sure. And John places this detail in the story as a way of showing that all these things happened according to the will of God and to the, dispel any rumors that Jesus was actually not dead. Everything was going according to plan, but not the one set out by the Pharisees. This was the plan of God set down before the foundations of the earth. Our Old Testament passage that we read from Isaiah 53 in verse 5 says, but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. And Psalm 3430 says, He keeps all of his bones, not one of them is broken. All these refill, uh, fulfill the requirements of Numbers 912, where the Passover lamb is to be sacrificed, but not one of his bones will be broken. Remember John the Baptist speaking through the Holy Spirit as he recognized Jesus in John 129. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was the sacrifice lamb. And now upon the cross, the perfect sacrifice lamb has been, has been slain. Her epistle, epistle reading from Romans chapter, chapter 10 verses 5 through 7 and 10 through 12. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you, ha you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And that by, by that we have all been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. In verse 11 and 12, And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ was offered for all time a, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So the first compelling reason that I should consider my sin on Good Friday is because Jesus loved me enough to take my punishment and experience what I deserved. That's not something to take lightly. Or forget. Instead, it demands my reflection and my recommitment to God, to loving obedience to Him and thankfulness. 
And the second focus that I believe the Lord wants us to contemplate on Good Friday is to prayerfully consider what the disciples went through as they saw their Lord and the object of their hope placed in a tomb. Perhaps there were a few moments as Jesus hung upon the cross where they were thinking that maybe he was going to pull this off. He was going to, he was going to come down off the cross and he was going to deal with the enemies and there would be a sudden move of power and glory. The enemy would be defeated. But when they took down his lifeless body and placed it in a tomb, all hope was gone. I suspect that fear became their constant companion as they wondered what was going to happen to them as Jesus' followers, his disciples. None of the Gospels comment too much on what the disciples, disciples were thinking or feeling during, during that time, but I can imagine they were numb with grief at a level they'd never known before. I suspect that they went to bed not wanting to wake up. Everything they cared about was gone. Their dreams, their view of God was shattered. And they most likely felt betrayed by Jesus. What was he talking about? The one thing that had to be nagging at their conscience was the fact that they had all run away like cowards. What would it have been like if they had stayed and fought valiantly? Would God have given them the strength like he gave to David's mighty men of 30? Would it have been better to die fighting than to run away like cowards? I can't even imagine the, the turmoil, the self-loathing, and the pain that Peter dealt with. Try to consider what was going through Peter's mind as his thoughts returned over and over to the fact that he had denied that he even knew Jesus three times to protect his, himself. How could he ever get over that? How could he get past it? How could he live with the shame and the guilt and the judgment of others? Where could he go and hide? I'm sure they were all inconsolable and I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't a few arguments and fights that weekend. They just didn't seem any good thing could happen from this. Where could they go from here? And so all they saw was darkness and despair. Have you ever had something happen that was so traumatic and so overwhelming that it consumed all of your thoughts and darkened every possibility that you could think of? I have. And I didn't know if I could live through it or if I even wanted to. But just like the disciples, Jesus came to my rescue and the overwhelming darkness began to recede and light shone into my life again. But there was that season where it was just dark and I think that was theirs for the moment. One of the most important points that we can take away from Good Friday is that there are many, many people around us, around the world, around our community who are enveloped in that kind of darkness. And additionally, right now, throughout the world, families are grieving the loss of loved ones who had the COVID-19 virus, while others live in fear of it attacking them. There are millions who will likely be ruined financially because of this virus. And there are many in our community who for various reasons feel no hope for the future and they live trying to embrace anything that will get them through the day, no matter what it is. It never satisfies. It never satisfies a need that only Jesus can fill. And so they continue to spiral down into darkness and anger and in hopelessness. I've met many here. Scientists are working night and day to try to find a vaccination, a vaccination for the coronavirus, and that's good. We should pray for their success. But the truth is that the greatest problem that people are suffering from is that they do not know Jesus Christ. Without him, there is no hope for the future, including eternity. 
Today we reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross and also our need to lay hold of that sacrifice by faith, trusting him to shine light into the darkness of our own hearts and for those around us. It's also a reminder that the gospel is the only true message of hope and salvation for everyone who will receive it. And we are the messengers. We have the cure. This is a day that reminds us of the darkest days of Jesus and how he made a way for us by sacrificing his own perfect life. This is why this day is good and holy and the reason for living. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, tonight as we contemplate what it was like for you those that day as you were beaten, as you were made fun of, as you were maligned, as you were ridiculed, as you were spit upon, as you were humiliated, as your friends had run away, and as you hung upon the cross, your father had to turn away. Because you not only took our sin upon you, you became sin. Paul tells us in first and second Corinthians two, five, I mean five, two, that that you became sin for us. The one who was righteous became sin so that we could have righteousness. We thank you for that. I, I pray that this day will be a special day of remembrance so that when it comes to Easter morning, we see the resurrection as the best news ever, both then and now. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.